The Whistler. That whistle. The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Treasure Hunt. If it were possible somehow to stand at some point in the distant future and look back at the life of Robert Bolton, we'd find it neatly divided into two halves, divided by a matchstick. The first half was successful. Robert was an egotist whose egomania led him to believe that because he'd given the world the ecstatic pleasure of his company for 32 years, it owed him a living in return. He lived by his wits, and because they were extraordinary wits, he managed to dodge, double in his tracks like a smart halfback avoiding tacklers, and keep one jump ahead of the law. And then one day, shortly after the train he was riding on, pulled into the little country town of Redmond, Robert, standing on the station platform, put a cigarette in his mouth and reached in his pocket for a match. The pocket was empty. He shrugged and strolled across the street to the general merchandise store to buy a box. $200,000 at least. That's what you've been saying ever since old Colonel Randolph died. They've been living on credit for five years. Oh, every soul in town. And I'm telling you, Gregory Mott, we ain't going to see one red cent. You mark my word. How do you know we ain't? Well, just you go back and look at them bills the Randolph sisters have got run up here. Flour and eggs and milk and everything. It's nigh on to $500. But Martha and Evie's bound to find that money any day now. Can't never tell. If I hear that again, I'll scream out loud. When we find Grandfather Randolph, $200,000 will pay our bills. <laughs> well, they ain't found it yet, and they ain't gonna, if you ask me. Huh. Reckon the old colonel hit it good. And that's another thing. Why did any man hide that much money around and leave a crazy poem to tell where it was hid? Is that reasonable? Oh, I know, Lou. It's just that Martha and Evie Randolph are such nice... I know. They're ladies. Wearing them lace things like they was rich. I notice Martha's too much a lady to marry Sheriff Conway and get her bills paid. Maybe he ain't ask her. <laughs> Evie thinks she's too good for him, and that's why. Ain't no excuse for letting their bills run. Why, they could take in boarders. They're willing to take in boarders, but who stops over in Redmond? Well, talking about it won't get us our money. I'm just getting tired <clears throat> of this whole I thing. beg your pardon. Oh, hello there, mister. Been here long? No, I just came in for a box of matches. Sure. Here you are. Thanks. Uh, you just passing through on the train? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, have a nice town here, Mr. Mott. I was on my way to Florida, but Redmond is such a charming little place. Might stay over for a while? Could be, Mr. Mott. Could be. Oh, uh, conductor? Yeah? My name's Robert Bolton. I'm in car 63, bedroom G. Would you have the porter get my baggage, please? I'm getting off here. With the prologue of tonight's story, Treasure Hunt, to another strange story by The Whistler. And now, back to The Whistler. Robert, that matchstick made a difference, didn't it? They laid it on the line for you while you were waiting at the counter in the store. And you're thinking it over carefully now, as you sit in the parlor of the huge old Randolph home in Redmond, making your first impression on the Randolph sisters. 
It took you only a minute to analyze them. Evie, ailing, suspicious, jealous of the family tradition. Martha, 45, hungry for sympathy, color, laughter. She's uh, made to order for you, isn't she, Robert? Your opening move is a triple play. You talk to Evie, your remarks are aimed at Martha, and your mind is on the $200,000 hidden by Grandfather Randall. And so you see, Miss Evie, I just had to stop in here and inquire about a room. It's, it's such a perfect place to uh, uh, finish my book. Oh, you're an author. Yes. <laughs> I write poetry. Poetry? Oh, how beautiful. I have always considered poetry a frivolous way of expressing thoughts which might better be done in prose. I love it. Your judgment is not to be considered, Martha. But uh, go on, Mr. Bolton. Well, I graduated from Harvard in 1931, and I wandered around a bit. India, China, Japan... Even got as far as Tibet. Oh, how wonderful. You've really been to those places. Yes. Mr. Bolton, I am not interested in your wanderings. Oh, I'm sorry. But I've got to have some place in which to write a, a place like this, Miss Randolph, with these lovely trees, these grand old rooms with their fine floors. That mahogany staircase. Why, that's a poem in itself, Miss Randolph. A sweeping curve ascending high to end its rapture in the sky. Oh, that's William Brown. Why, yes, Miss Martha. You know his poems? He that to the voice is near, breaking from your ivory pale. Need not walk abroad to hear the delightful nightingale. I think it's so lovely. And I think we have had enough of this grammar school recitation. Yes, Evie. Mr. Bolton, you may have the room. However, I am not a well woman. Therefore, I must have it understood that should I change my mind at any time, I shall expect you to understand. Uh, Martha? Yes, Evie? You may show Mr. Bolton to the room above the veranda. Thank you again, Miss Randolph. I'm sure that uh, my stay here will prove mutually profitable. Well, you're established in the Randolph house, Robert Bolton. But there's work to be done if there are $200,000 hidden someplace. You know Evie Randolph is shrewd, almost as clever as you are. But again, there's Martha, poor, homely, pathetically eager Martha, who hangs on your words. And you can be charming, can't you, Robert? It's not long before you've made a conquest, and such a simple one. Martha never has had such wonderful times, has she? Movies, poetry, a drive in a rented car. <laughs> Oh, please, Mr. Bolton. You mustn't go so far. Why not? It's like living in another world. Just flashes of the earth we know. Gone before you can see the ugliness, the gray drabness. Oh, yes. It is like that. Oh, oh. Oh, it's wonderful <laughs> to hear you laugh, Martha. Wonderful. I... I was laughing, wasn't I? Her laughter like the bells of Eden. Oh, it's... It's all so lovely, Robert. Oh, so lovely. Do you really mean this is the first movie you've seen in three years? I never go out much, Robert. You see, Evie... Oh, you're wonderful, Martha. So unselfish. Yes, Robert. It takes only three days. Martha is hopelessly in love with you. But you've been very careful not to make love to her, haven't you? That you've been saving for a very important moment. A moment that comes one day as you walk with Martha in the garden of the Randolph place. Robert, is, is there anything wrong? Wrong? Is, is something troubling you? Well, the book isn't going so well. Oh, is that all? But you've got to expect times when, when you think things are all wrong. You told me that yourself, Robert. Yes, but this is different, Martha. I'm... Maybe I'm a failure. Maybe people are right when they say a poet is some odd kind of a freak. But I don't feel that way. I know that, Martha. And I'm grateful. No. I'm the one who should be grateful. And I am, Robert. So grateful. You? But what for? Oh, because you've made me laugh. You you brought something here that... that... I shouldn't talk like this, Robert. Why not, Martha? Well, yes. I... No, no, I won't say it. Say what, Robert? Look here, I... I... Oh. <laughs> well, for the first time in my life, I find myself unable to choose the right words. But 
Martha, what what would you say if I told you I I loved you? Oh. Oh, please, Robert, no. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it. But you did. You did. I'm I'm a fool. You said it. But you can't mean it. Look at me. Look at me, Robert. I am, Martha. There's nothing for you to fall in love with. I'm ugly, Robert. Ugly. Don't say that. It's true. It's true, Robert. No, no, it's not. Listen to me, Martha. What is beauty if it has no soul? What is loveliness if there is no heart? That's... Robert Bolton. Martha. Oh, Robert. No, no, I shouldn't have. What have I to offer you? Nothing. You and your sister have all this. The house, the garden, money. Money? Well, Robert, dear, we have no more than you. Oh, you're joking. No, my darling. No, I'm not. Abby and I have been living on credit. Everyone thinks we'll find Grandfather Randolph's money. Money? There is money? I don't believe it, but Abby does. She's looked for it so many times. Oh, treasure hunt, huh? You're, You're making fun of it. Oh, no, no, dearest. But, well, things like that just don't happen, not in real life. Suppose there there was money, and we found it. Then you wouldn't have to worry about staying here with Evie. She could have the money, and we could have each other. Do you mean that, Robert? Don't you believe me, Martha? Oh, yes, Robert. But Evie would never let us have the verse. Verse? I don't understand. Well, Grandfather Randolph left the secret of the money hidden in a little verse he wrote. Evie keeps it in her room. I've only seen it once. Oh, well, that's that. But... I could make a copy of it when she's asleep. She wouldn't have to know. Oh, you're clever, sweetheart. You know, I never would have thought of that. And if we find the money, we... We We... shall taste the sweets of Araby and live but for the ecstasy that life shall bring to us. That was simple, wasn't it, Robert? Having Martha suggest a plan herself was clever. She doesn't suspect a thing. Poor, homely Martha, who doesn't know you're going to leave the moment you find the money. And the same night, she brings you a piece of paper. Here it is, Robert. Are you sure Evie is? Evie is asleep. I left her medicine on the table by her bed so she doesn't have to call me. Ah, You are clever, my darling. Now, now, let me see the verse. Oh, here it is. Now, when the bishop's mitre points to three, then a shadow long you'll see. Four steps left and two steps right. Careful now, you'll need the light. Oh, it it sounds crazy. Just just a minute. Bishop's mitre. Bishop's mitre. I look that the chest uh, the chest table in the corner. Has it ever been moved? Oh no. Evie wouldn't allow anything to be moved. Then where are the chessmen? In the drawer of the chest table. Oh, good. Well, why are you setting up the chest table? You'll see now, now. Which bishop? There are four. One has to point to three. To three. All of them pointed to the ceiling now, but if we... If we lay them on their sides, then... Look! This black queen's bishop, it points to the grandfather's clock on the other side of the room. And if you point it to three... That's it! The bishop's mitre points to three. Martha! Martha! <gasps> it's Effie. She woke up. You, you, you better go. We'll continue this tomorrow night. Go ahead. <laughs> won't wake up tonight, will she? I don't know, Robert. But did you figure out... I think so, no. The bishop's mitre points to three. Then a shadow long you'll see. Shadow. Let's... Let's look outside. At three o'clock, the shadow of that elm tree would be... Come on! You're so wonderful, Robert. It's all so simple now. Four steps left. Then two steps right. To right in front of the old cooling shed. And the next line reads, Careful now, you'll need a light. Martha! That means we'll need a light to see inside the cooling shed. That's it! The money is in the cooling shed. It is! It is! But, uh, uh, we just don't have a light now, do we? We'll have to wait until tomorrow night. Well, I can get a lantern. No, no, Martha, darling. We'll wait until tomorrow night. But why? Can't we tell Evie now? You're not going to tell Evie until we get the money, do you hear? I... All right, Robert. Anything you say.
Of course, Robert. Wait until tomorrow night. Then you'll plan to sneak outside without Martha. And you needed time to pack, didn't you? Get ready to leave suddenly with the money and without Martha. So the next day you sit in the garden smoking a cigarette, smiling to yourself, thinking how easy it was. Then suddenly... Howdy, Mr. Bolton. Oh, hello, Sheriff Conway. You know me, huh? Why, of course. You've been pointed out to me. In addition, the star glittering on your vest is, in itself, a monumental advertisement. Yep. Mind if I sit down on the mic? Why, certainly not, Sheriff. Make yourself at home. Uh, did you come here just to sit in the sun, or do you have something more important on your mind? Well, Bolton, I ain't one to beat around the bush. There's some talk going around about you and Miss Martha. Really? What harm is there in that? Well, you're a young man, handsome. <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff. <laughs> I didn't know you cared. I don't think you're up to any good, Bolton. Martha's good 15, 20 years older than you. Oh, and... so that's the way the wind blows, is it? Torchbearing in the provinces. You love her, don't you? Listen, I came here friendly-like, but I'm having a hard time now f- to keep from smashing that pretty face of yours. But you won't do it, Sheriff, because you'd look a great deal sillier and more stupid than you do now. You can't afford that, Sheriff. You're smart, ain't you, Bolton? Smart enough to know you haven't got a thing to say in this matter. Now you listen. I intend to remain here as long as I like. You're after that money. You can prove that, of course. He Uh, doesn't have to. Miss Evie, you hadn't ought to come out here. I can... It was thoughtful of you, Sheriff Conway, to concern yourself with our affairs, Martha's and mine. However, I am quite capable of handling this. Miss Evie, don't go getting riled up now. You're hard to Please, Sheriff Conway. Mr. Bolton. Yes, Miss Evie. I gave you to understand when you came here that any time I chose to ask you to leave, you would do so. So what? Consider this your last day here. You'd better reconsider that. You heard Miss Evie Bolton. Sheriff? Yes, Miss Evie. Mr. Bolton, I'm a sick woman, but I'm not blind. My sister Martha is impressionable. She is infatuated with you, and you've done nothing to discourage her. Perhaps I love her. That's ridiculous, and you know it. Mr. Bolton, if you're not out of the house in, in one hour... I shall ask Sheriff Conway to evict you. Martha might have something to say about that. I've already told her. You have one hour, Mr. Bolton. Well, Robert, that was a blow, wasn't it? If you leave, the money stays in the cooling shed. If you stay, the sheriff will have a field day throwing you out. Your only hope is Martha, isn't it? And you haven't much time. You sit alone in the garden thinking. And suddenly it comes to you. There is a way, isn't there? You hurry over to the little pharmacy where you and Martha bought the medicine for Evie. The clerk knows you and says nothing when you ask for a little bottle of poison to uh, kill rats. You sign the poison book and hurry back to Martha with a half hour to go. She's in the parlor playing the piano. Robert. Please, Martha, go on play. I want to remember you like this. It rather fits the mood. Please, Robert. I'll just stand here by the piano and... Oh, I... It's... It's poison. Robert, what were you going to do with this? You weren't supposed to see that. Give it to me. You... You were going to kill yourself. All my life I've had cherished and loved things taken away from me. I'm tired, Martha, tired and beaten. Misunderstood by the people I love the most. Your sister. You. Not me, Robert. I swear it. Not me. You were going to stand by and let me leave, weren't you? But what could I do? Evie, you me... see? I love you, Robert. I love you so much. And does that solve the problem? No. What can we do? What can I do? You could marry me. Then Evie would see that I do love you. Robert. Marry me. Don't you want to, my darling? But Evie. Give me that bottle. No! No, I'll marry you, Robert! Now, today, we can go to Milltown right away. Yes, 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 anything you say, Robert. Anything you say. You don't seem to like me as a brother-in-law, Evie. I despise and loathe you, Mr. Bolton. Evie, you don't know, Robert. You don't understand me. You poor blind fool. Don't you see what he's after? But, Evie, Just he... a moment, Martha. 
Very well, Mr. Bolton. I suppose I have no alternative. You're quite correct. Martha, will you leave the room for a moment? What? Mr. Bolton and I have something to discuss in private. Well, if you say so, Eddie. Be with you in a minute, dear. Yes, Robert. Now, Mr. Bolton. This is what you wanted, isn't it, Mr. Bolton? $200,000 in securities. You've got it. Of course. I've had it for ten years. The verse was simple for me, too, Mr. Bolton. I thought it was cash. Half of it is yours, of course. Shall we divide it now? No, we'll have to have them analyzed. It'll take time. It's simpler than you think, Mr. Bolton. As a matter of fact, I'd just as soon you had them all. What are you talking about? There you are. Take them. Well, I uh, can't say I expected this. I'm not being generous, Mr. Bolton. You see, these securities have been worthless since 1929. What? Take them, Mr. Bolton, and get out. What kind of a trick is this? I said get out. You know it now. Tell the whole town about it. We defrauded them. We lived for ten years on credit because they believed the money was here. You let me marry that ugly, stupid sister of yours. She knew it all the time. She did not know it because I never told her I found them. Now get out. Get out! (laughs) Take your securities, Mr. Bolton. You've got what you came for. (laughs) Martha! Martha, come quickly! Martha! You're ill. Oh, Robert, please. You. You, I hope you die. Robert! Robert, wait! What time's the train leave, clerk? Little trouble up the line. Might be late today, maybe five o'clock. You can quit worrying, Mr. Bolton. You ain't taking no trains. What do you mean, Sheriff? You ain't leaving, Redmond. No? Well, just try and stop me. Let her charge desertion. Let her charge... It ain't that, Bolton. It's murder. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to the Whistler. That one stopped you, didn't it, Robert? For once, you have nothing to say. And though you don't know it, the first half of your life, the half you lived before you reached into your pocket on the station platform at Redmond, and found you were out of matches, is over. And the second half is about to begin. The sheriff refuses to explain further as you go together back to the Randolph house. He waits until you go through the door into Evie Randolph's bedroom, until you stand there staring down at her still figure on the bed. Sheriff, I swear to you I didn't. I tell you I had nothing to do with it. You bought this bottle of poison at Rigby's pharmacy. For myself, I told you. Ask Martha. I got a feeling the jury's not going to believe anything Martha says about you. They'd think she was trying to cover up for you. But I ain't telling you anything, though, am I? You likely know juries pretty well by now. Evie got that poison by mistake. Sure, when Martha took it away from you and hid it in the medicine cabinet. And that's where poor Evie found it. Sick, dazed. That's it. I knew you didn't believe I did it, Sheriff. Who says I don't? What? What are you getting at? Well, you can have your pick. You can leave Redmond. Yes. And face a murder charge. There's the money, the fight you had with Evie... The poison register at the store? Wait a minute, you can't do this. No. Or you can stay here and make Martha a good husband. Write poetry for her, take her riding, make her happy. And I'll forget about the other. Well? I... I won't do it. Huh? Murderers hang in this state, Bolton. All right, Sheriff. You win. And I'll be around checking up. And if you ever try to run out on her... I'll reopen the case on new evidence. And I swear before the Lord, Bolton, I'll hang you. (laughs) 
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Russell Hughes, music by Wilbur Hatch. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.